Well, it's a pleasure. And as you heard, I always introduce my husband as my health insurance plan. Because one of the values of a marrying a state employee or a public employee is that up until now they had a health insurance. And of course we know that story may not be the future of public employees. So first let me just describe a little more detail about who I am. And I am a, let's see, in 1971 I decided to go to St. Ola College in Northfield, Minnesota. Ya yeah, sure, you betcha. And I went to St. Olaf, and the reason I went to St. Olaf was I was right after the Vietnam War, and I believed in universal draft. Because either all of us went or none of us went. So what did I do? I joined the first class of women in Air Force ROTC. They had no idea what to do with us. But I tried, all right? And I was so bad, we had marching every Wednesday. And I was so bad at marching on campus, I had to go to remedial marching on Thursday. But so I joined, I joined Air Force ROTC. I was pre-SEM. I was on my way to divinity school. I studied in Israel the separation of temple and state. I went to Milwaukee and I worked in a poverty agency. And I did two other things. I had sex and took birth control. So why am I telling you this? Because I'm your slut. And, and I, I want Rush Limbaugh to understand that I am your slut. But more important than being your slut, I gotta tell you the rest of the story. Because you heard that my first baby was born without health insurance. Can I tell you why? Because when I graduated from law school, my husband was working for a firm that he decided to help organize a union against. And as a result of his union organizing, he got fired. And when he got fired, guess what we lost? Our health insurance. So you know what? When you have no job and no income and birth control costs $50 a month, what do you give up? The birth control. So who had a baby without health insurance? I did. So I don't want him to hear him say, what's 30 or $50? When you are struggling, it's the difference between feeding a family and not feeding a family. They don't get it. They are so damn out of touch. And Rush doesn't get it more than you know. We know what he does. We know his contract is this huge. But here's something really interesting. Because as he said all those obnoxious things about that Georgetown law student, called her a prostitute and a slut, and then said, if I'm going to pay for your birth control, I want the damn videos. What is more amazing about all that is that, is that who owns Rush Limbaugh? Who owns Rush Limbaugh is a group called Premier Radio. Who owns Premier? Clear Channel. Who owns Clear Channel? Bain Capital. You know Bain Capital and Mitt Romney? That's who owns Rush Limbaugh. And now you want to know why when Mitt heard those disgusting comments, his only response was, I wouldn't have used those words. Really? What words would you have used? All right? So I just want to set that stage. And then I want to tell you something else. We are in Memphis, and I'm flipping out because in 1985, I was a freshman legislator. And what you need to know is, I'm sort of a, I, I pushed the envelope. I gave birth to my baby a week and a half before I got elected to the New Hampshire House. So what did I do? I breastfed on the floor of the New Hampshire House. <laughs> and, and you gotta understand, if you're gonna have women in, and the cause is to get them through the roof, we're bringing our babies with us. So here I am breastfeeding on the floor of the house, I'm a freshman, and I get a call on a Tuesday night. And my girlfriend calls me up and she says, you gotta help me on the floor tomorrow, we're having a floor fight. And I said, what's the floor fight on? She said, Martin Luther King's birthday. And I said, Catherine, I don't, I mean, I know the issue, but I, this isn't my thing. I, I mean, I'll help you, I'll vote for you, but where's the rest of the committee? She said, Arnie, 
If you don't stand up with me tomorrow, I'll be by myself. That's in a legislature that has 400 members. And I said, oh my God, I'm with you. And there's actually a video of me shaking like a leaf, handing my three-month-old off to my seatmate to go up and fight on Martin Luther King's birthday. Do you know how many votes we got in 1985? And I will apologize. Out of 400 votes, we got 60. All right? What was the last state in the nation to pass Martin Luther King's birthday? My damn state. But I need to let you know, I am here, and I just, I, I, I'm, I'm in awe. All right, now let me talk a little bit more. So what we have seen, and I saw this this morning, is that there has been an incredible assault on anything public sector. Whether you're a school teacher, whether you're working in a school, whether you're a firefighter, if you are public sector workers, you are under assault. They are blaming you for everything wrong with this economy. You know it's your pension that's driven us to our economic knees. It's your damn health care that's causing our budgets to hemorrhage. And I suddenly realized, why does this conversation sound so familiar? Can I tell you why? Because you're the new welfare queens of the 2012 era. Remember? Remember Ronald Reagan and the first years in the 1990s with what they said about welfare queens? Well, let me tell you a story, and this is why it suddenly hit me. In 1996, I was running for Congress, and I got invited up to a very poor conservative town in Lisbon, New Hampshire. And I walk up into this community, and I walk in the room, and I'm going, oh my god, it's a setup. I can just feel the anger in the room and the tension. And these people, as I walk in, say, Arnie, we don't like you. And I'm going, gee, have we met? And I said, so why don't you like me? And they said, because you defend that welfare system. And you defend those welfare women. And I said, really? What are you talking about? He said, well, there's something you need to know, Arnie. We work 60 and 70 hours a week cutting lumber, moving coal. And you know what? Those welfare women have access to doctors and get Medicaid, and we don't have damn health insurance. He said, you know what else about those welfare women? Someone takes care of their kids and helps them with Head Start, and nobody takes care of our kids. And we work 50, 60, and 70 hours a week. And he went through this whole thing about what these welfare women were getting and how they were working so damn hard, and they had none of it. And I looked at them and I said, you know, if I heard that, I'd be pissed too. I said, but you know what's really confusing about this conversation? It's not that there's something wrong with welfare but there's something wrong with work. When you can work 60 hours and can't afford to take your kid to a doctor, there's something wrong with work. When you don't have the ability to feed your family and you're working 50 and 60 hours, then there's something wrong with work. But look what they've done to you. Look what they've done. They've said that there's the welfare woman that's evil. So they've taken you off the problem. So who's the new welfare queen? You are. And why are you the new welfare queen? Because they have to pay their tax dollars to fund your jobs, and you still have a job, and you, my God, you have health care. And oh my God, you might even have a pension. And you know what? They're furious because they're cutting the checks so you can have something. But what's their anger about? It's not their anger about you having a job it's not their anger about you having a pension or a health care. It's the fact that they don't and that they're so damn vulnerable. And so what is their answer and their solution? Their answer and their solution is taking it away from you. Because if I don't have it, then why should you have it? How does that fix the problem? It doesn't. It just makes all of us more vulnerable. And you know what's ironic? Is that people without health care and without access to a doctor, don't even get how important it is for you to have it. And let me explain to you why. There's a town in northern New Hampshire that's called Berlin, real poor. And the mayor of Berlin was a Republican. And he begged for two prisons. He wanted a prison more than you could possibly imagine. 
And do you know why he wanted a prison? Because it meant jobs, right? No, no, no. The reason he wanted a prison was that those prison jobs would have health insurance. And because those prison jobs would have health insurance, his hospital could stay open for the rest of the community. Because if they didn't have anybody with access to some kind of health care, guess what? The OBGYN was out of there. The hospital shut their doors. So the only way he could protect the rest of his town was to make sure that there was a core group of people that could actually sustain the community. And who was that core group of people? But people just like you. They don't even get it. And what's worse is, is that we keep being told we have nothing, that this nation is in deficit, that we can't afford the budget, that we don't have the taxes, that we can't invest in education. Let me use a word I don't like to use too often, horseshit. <laughs> and, and, and the reason I'm going to use that word is that that's just not true. And I'm going to prove to you how not true this is. I have gotten myself 10 volunteers. Will my 10 volunteers please come up here? And I decided that you need to understand how not poor this country is. The fact that we have terrible tax policy is not an indication that we don't have unconscionable wealth. The fact that you can't fund your schools and you can't fund your programs, I'd like you all to take a chair. And I want, wait a minute, there's one person here. I want you to take the chair at the very end. You, wait, wait, come, come over here. I want you to stand over one, just go over one chair. And I'll just leave this chair blank. Okay, the rest of you sit. Sit. And will you take the first chair? Thank you. Okay, and, and so one of the things I want to talk to you about is one, we have lots of money in this country. We just don't know how to tap it, okay? Because what do we know about our tax policy in the United States? Our tax policy is totally screwed. Who are the richest people in America today? The one percenters. What do a lot of them do for a living? Let me give you an example. They do nothing. They, you ever heard of a hedge fund manager? Okay? These are people that basically bet on whether the economy will go up or go down. So they really do do nothing. They're like fancy gamblers. So what you need to know is hedge fund managers pay at a tax rate of 15%. 15%. Now what you need to know is in 2001, all the hedge fund managers in the United States, you know how much money they made in total? Five billion dollars. That's in 2001. Can I bring you to today? One hedge fund manager made five billion dollars. One in one year. And can I give you an example of how much one billion dollars is? How many of you make, well don't raise your hand. How many of you imagine yourself making or are making twenty-nine thousand dollars a year? Okay, not a bad salary. $29,000 a year? If you took every dime of your $29,000 a year and put it in a bank, do you know how long it would take you to make $1 billion? 34,458 years. That's a billion, sweetheart. Now I'm going to show you something more exciting. It's called Life in America. All right. So you see everyone sitting here. I'm going to hand them a little sign. And the sign says 10%. 10 for you. Can you sh sit, hang it out there? Thank you. 10 for you. 10 for you. 10 for you. All right. Now they're all sitting on a chair. And as you noticed when I came up, did every chair have 10% behind it? Yes. All right. Now. If we lived in a communist country, we don't, even if they think Barack Obama is a communist. Okay, but if we lived in a perfect communist country, every chair represents 10% of the wealth in America. Every person here represents 10% of the population. In a communist country that's never actually existed, every person would have a chair. 10% of the population would have 10% of the wealth. So that's never happened. 
Now I am going to show you life in these United States. Will everyone please stand up? Will you all move behind your chair? Okay. Now I'm going to take this woman right here who sat on the end. She is going to be my top 10% of the population in the United States, all right? The top 10, come here, sweetheart. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a favor. I ask you if you would take your shoes off. Will you take off one shoe, please? Thank you. Now, what you need to know is I needed a tall person because I needed a big foot. So, so when she takes off her shoe, let me assist you. Okay, now I want you to stand over here. Her shoe represents the top 1% of the population in America, right? Now, if this is 10% of the wealth, let me tell you how much this one shoe controls. Does it control this 10%? No, honey. Does it control this 20%? No, honey. Wait a minute. I was going to use it, but I won't. So imagine her shoelace coming off. Does it control this 30% of the wealth, her shoe? No, honey. Her shoe controls 40% of the wealth in America. 40, a freaking shoe. We're talking about 1%. That's 40%. That's more than we've ever seen in this country. That a handful of people control 40% of the wealth. Now let me show you the rest of the story. Can I have the rest of my 9%? Come here. Can I have the next 10%? percent we got 20%. All right. I want you to sit on these three chairs. Just lay yourself down. So our top 10%, next 10, next 10, you have two. Well, actually, one and a half. So just put your tush right about here. All right? So the top 20%, I want you to look, have basically... What is it? It's about 85, 86% of the wealth. We have two human beings up here. Look at how many chairs they have. Look at what's standing behind them. That's you. You have a chair and a half. You tell me how a country functions on a chair and a half. You tell me how you afford health care on a chair and a half. You tell me how your kid affords college on a chair and a half. And what do we know about college students today? The highest level of debt in America today is college students. They have no future. You can't buy a house when you have $100,000 of debt for college. You can't even imagine it. Am I right? Look what we've done. This is, and it was, it's never been this bad. It's never been this bad. There is no middle class. There is no middle class dream. Opportunity has gone out the window. And part of the problem is my friend and her 1%, this shoe now controls politics. This shoe does. You know why. They passed that stupid Citizens United case that says you can spend unlimited money. Ask Mitt Romney how much money they've spent to totally smear his opposition. Not to say, celebrate who he is, because nobody wants him. They just figure they don't want the other guy. And this is millions of dollars. So not only does this 1% control the politics, but then they control the laws and the rules. And the laws and the rules say you are expendable. You are unnecessary. And they keep saying, oh, but Arnie, this one shoe, it's the job creator. All right? And I'm looking, I'm going, really? Has anyone asked the question, where are they creating the jobs? All right? That's the most important question you ask the 1%. Because what do we know now? They don't need, they go to China, they go to India, they go to Brazil, because you know what? You're going to make the fastest buck, and it ain't going to be here. So what do we do? We screw ourselves twice. We don't tax them. We say they're job creators and they send the jobs and the money out of the country, and then what do they want to do? They don't want to fund education, and they don't want to support you. You are the expendable ones. I was just listening to what happened in Alabama. Oh my God, the armpit of the nation today. 
Because what does the chamber do? The chamber of commerce stands there saying, let's defund public education. I thought, I kept hearing that businesses wanted an educated workforce. How can you have an educated workforce and not educate kids? And you know what you do. Not even teachers actually stand up for you. You may leave now. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you very much. I told you it wasn't a lot of heavy lifting. And, and that's the part I think that breaks my heart more than anything else, is that you and I know that the story that you just saw up here, it's a story that we're in the same boat together. I mean, we all are that one and a half chairs. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're a firefighter, whether you're working in a school in any capacity as an educator, we're all in it together. We can't throw each other under the bus. It just doesn't work. I remember listening to Newt Gingrich. What did he say about the custodian? Oh my God. He said that he, yeah, he said that a kid could replace the custodian in the school because it would teach them a good work ethic. And I'm thinking, does he have any idea what the hell they do? And the reason why you need to ask that question is, what do we know about schools in America today? Not only have they been underfunded, what kind of repair are they in? How much delayed repair and improvement in schools? Ever been to a gym that has moguls? All right? Ever see, I mean, I live in New Hampshire, and in New Hampshire, this is where we're cutting off our nose to spite our face. The most expensive way to heat any building is with oil, right? Very expensive. Everybody wants natural gas or something else. The state that is the second most dependent on oil in America is my state, and we're a cold state. So what happens? They hemorrhage with the energy bill. They have these old, old, inefficient oil furnaces to heat the school that the custodian is holding together because he's got to be the super engineer and the super plumber, and then people get angry because we can't afford the school. Well, of course, you can't afford the heat. And you can't afford to change the furnace and make it into gas. And you're going to get rid of the custodian? The only guy who knows what to do? How stupid is that? You know? Think about it. And, and it's not only that. It's, it, I live across the street from an elementary school. And a friend of mine was telling me this story the other day. Her friend is a bus driver. And he says, you don't understand, Arnie. The first person who sees a kid every morning is the bus driver. And he said, it's the bus driver that knows that the kid has now come to school four days in 10 below zero with a coat you shouldn't even wear in 100 degrees. Because he sees the fact that that kid is obviously not being cared for. And when they run into school, nobody's paying attention because all the coats go on the hook and the principal is watching everything else. But who knows? It's the bus driver that knows. And the bus driver doesn't sit there and say, oh, God, the kid doesn't have a coat. The bus driver says, oh, my God, what's going on in that family? And without that first responder, the kid is screwed, the system gets worse, and what happens? Nobody gets it. They're not just a driver. They're there to cherish our kids, and they're there to notice. That's the most important thing. It's not just about transportation. It's about noticing. They don't even get how important it is. And you know how important education is and how important having someone working with troubled kids in classes are. A friend of mine used to be the majority leader in Illinois. And when I was running for governor, we were talking one day. And he said, Arnie, do you know how we plan future prison beds in the state of Illinois? I had no clue. He said, we go into the second grade class and we count the number of children at risk. And based on that number, we plan future prison beds. There are seven. There are seven. I'm looking at him going, so what are you doing? Who's working with these kids? Who's investing in those kids? Who's touching their lives? You want to spend $36 to put them in a penal institution and throw their lives away, and you're not willing to spend $5,000 to have an aide work with them? What are you, nuts? But that's what's happening. And you know it, and you see it, but they don't know it. And if they do know it, you have to start asking, who are they working for? 
Are they working for the good of us? Or are they working for a handful of shoes who don't care about us? And what's really sad is someone said to me, well, Arnie, you know, if you start taxing those 1%, they'll leave. And I said, really? Where will they go? OK, where will they go? And here's the really pathetic part. If they do go, we won't even notice. Because they didn't make a difference while they were here. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Goodbye. Because if you're here, we're in it together. And if you're going to be so damn selfish, then au revoir, honey. Because we don't need it. And then last but not least, the other thing, you need to know that when I ran for governor, I ran on, um, on tax policy, believe it or not, in New Hampshire. Oh my god. But one of the things I learned very early was from my neighbor. And when I had young children, there was an older woman that lived in the house next door to me. And what you need to know is New Hampshire is one of those states that's kooky. We don't have a sales tax. We don't have an income tax. But we have the highest property tax rates in the nation, all right? The highest in the nation. And she would say to me, she would go to every school budget meeting, and she would vote against every budget. And I'd look at her, and I'm going, what are you doing? And she said, Arnie, you don't get it. It's not that I don't love your kids. It's not that I don't care about education. But you're asking me to make Sophie's choice. Do I heat my house or pay my property tax? Now, that was 20 years ago. Let's fast forward to today. What do we know about real estate in America? What we know is 20 to 40 percent of the mortgages in America are underwater. How many houses are in foreclosure? We can't even keep count. How many people have seen the value of their real estate tank 30 and 40 percent? So how do we fund so much of public education? On every family's liability, their house. So we're not even tapping what they have, income or wealth. We are tapping an asset that in the last three or four years has basically been devastated. And what kills me about all this is how did the real estate market get this way? Let me introduce you to Wall Street. Let me introduce you to the boys and girls that sold people houses they couldn't afford. And then why did they not care that you couldn't afford them? Because normally when you go to a bank, am I right? You go to a bank, this is the old days. You go to a bank and you bring all your paperwork for your income. And the banker will look at the paperwork and go, sorry, honey, you're not making enough. Come back in six months, come back in two years, I want 20% down. You can't afford to repay this loan. And if I'm going to loan you money, I want my money back. Here's what's changed in America today. Now you come to the bank and go, I don't need any paperwork. What kind of house do you want? Oh, you can afford 300000 No, actually 400000 Are you sure? Absolutely. OK, but what if I can't pay it back? He goes, oh, no, not a problem. In a year from now, the house will be worth 500000 and you'll be able to cash out with 100000 And why do they not care? And why do they want to sell you a house that's worth ridiculously more than you could ever afford? Because they don't want you to pay back, because they don't care because they don't own the paper anymore, because they're not a banker the way you and I thought of. So what did they do? They dumped it on the mortgage market. They sold it on the secondary market. They then cut it, pasted it, resold it. People cheated. And guess what? Wall Street went under. And who bailed them out? We did. We did. And now what's happened to our real estate market? They get bailed out. Their CEOs are back in, the, in, in, in golden. They're getting all their bonuses. We have real estate that isn't worth crap. And guess what? How do we fund our schools? With something that ain't worth crap. Isn't it interesting? You didn't even know that what Wall Street did was going to impact you. You thought it was just about real estate and mortgages. But now you know why people are so freaked out when they see the tax bill go up. Because they keep thinking, oh my god, I'm paying now more in taxes than I may in my mortgage. I can't even unload my house if I want to. And it's not you. Because you have a job, it isn't about you. But the system has set us up to fail. It has. So now I'm telling you, you've got to help fix the system. The one thing you have is your vote. You see, when you and Mitt Romney go into a voting booth, 
The little machine doesn't know that he's got gazillions and you got nothing. What the little machine knows is that you can check a box. And what I showed you up here with the one person and the two persons and the shoes was that there were a lot more people behind those chairs. And you are all those people behind those chairs. The people they're most afraid of is you. But you don't even know your power because they can't buy your truth. They can't buy your stories. And that's the problem. I remember once speaking in Washington, and I remember saying how angry I was about the Republicans because I was so jealous of my conservative friends. And they said, Arnie, you're jealous of a Republican? And I said, absolutely, because their entire ideology fits on a bumper sticker. And I go, it does? I go, sure. The word is no. No public education, no regulation, no taxes, no government. Think about it, am I right? No, no environmental you know, protection, no whatever it is with going on with the air. You know? the, their answer to everything is no. And you know why I'm jealous of the word no? Because you don't have to explain it. When I say no government, do you explain no government? When I say no taxes, do you have to explain? It's lovely. It ends the conversation. And what's the problem with my side? My side is we're about yes. Yes, some taxes. Yes, education. Yes, investment in infrastructure. Yes, we have to pay our bills. Yes, we have to take care of the environment. And you know what? Yes doesn't fit on a damn bumper sticker because you've got to explain the yes. I said, but you know what we have forgotten to remind the American people? And you need to hold on to this because you are a definition of yes. And that is, you don't build a life around no. You build a life around yes. Yes, I love you. Yes, I'll marry you. Yes, I'll take this job. Yes, I'll go to this school. And yes is about risk. It isn't easy to say yes. But yes is how you build a country. It's how you build a family. It's how you build a future. How can we embrace the no? Because what the no does is take away the future for us. So what I'm going to ask you is I'm going to ask you to figure out how to let people know who you are, what you do, and more important, it has gotten crazy in America today. I don't know what happened in 2010. I was told in my session this morning it was because we elected a black president. I don't think so. I think it's a combination of people seeing an economy still tanking, looking at billions going in to bail out Wall Street, and the Wall Street fat cats never going to jail. And on top of that, they're looking for a job. When I was a kid, my father could take care of my family. And then what happened in the 1970s, this has been a long, hard slog. All those manufacturing and good jobs left this country. So what happened? They said it was feminism. No, honey, it wasn't feminism. They needed us in the workforce because the only way we could keep paying the bills was if it was two of us working. So we created the illusion that the economy was still doing well because two were now providing for a family where one had provided for it. And you know what's pathetic about the 2020s and the 2012s? Is that we need a menage a trois. We need a third person in the workforce. And I don't know about you, I know the Mormons thought about it for a while, but they didn't do that. But that's what it's come down to. And you know what? We can't. We can't. That's not acceptable. So all I'm telling you right now is we've got to fight, we have to vote, and to a large extent we also have to do something else. We must fight for health care. And the reason we have to fight for health care Remember that story of the guys that were pissed off at the women on welfare because they had Medicaid? Well, the voters are angry at you because some of you have health care and they do not. And the best way to make sure that they don't castrate your budgets and get angry at you is to make sure they can go to a doctor when they're sick too. And that's the difference. Obama understood that piece, that if we're all in health care together, then they can't threaten it with you. They can't take it away from you because we all have it. Because you know what? We all need it. 
And the second time, I lost my health care, I need to tell you. It's 1991. I'm running for governor. It's the worst downturn in my state's history. The property tax bill on our house is $7,200 a year in 1992. My family's income was $23,000 a year. My husband had seen his income devastated. Because I was a public person running for office, they would know if I didn't pay the property tax bill, but they wouldn't know if we had canceled our health insurance. So my husband, without telling me, cancels the insurance. I have two little girls, and we go naked without health insurance. Guess who finds a lump in her breast as she's running? I do. About four months after I lost the election, I go to a doctor because we finally get reinsured because I'm bringing in an income again. And the doctor screams at me and says, Arnie Arneson, how come you didn't get a mammogram? How come you didn't check this out? And he said, the mammogram would only cost $75. We have a sliding scale. And I said, oh, I know that. I said, I could afford the mammogram. I just couldn't afford the answer. That was the second time I lost my health insurance. Do you know why I wanted to be the governor of New Hampshire? So I could go down to Congress and give him a knuckle sandwich. Because the governor of New Hampshire knew what it was like to be without health insurance. That is immoral. That is unconscionable. It sets us up. It divides us. It sets everyone up to fail. We must solve that, because if we solve that, we begin to create stability for you in every other aspect of your life. You can't turn this job into a career if you are under assault 24-7. You can't live like that. We need to protect your career. And I'm going to ask you to help. So you know what? 2012 is more important than you know. You have to vote. You have to share your stories. You have to bring a carload to every time it's a primary or an election. But you know what? We have what they don't have. We have numbers. They just have checks with commas in them. Anyway, thank you very much. Now, in the good talk show host mode, so now that I finished the formal part of the speech, there are two microphones here. And because there are two microphones here, and because I love to dialogue, I am going to say to people, please, if you have a question, or a thought, or a comment, or a story, or a reason, I want you to get to that microphone and talk. Because part of the things that I learned this morning, and you need to know what you've taught me. I went to the section this morning on lobbying. And I sat with about 12 or 14 people. And by the time they got done telling me what was happening to them, I wanted to put my fist through a wall because I was so helpful at what was happening. So you taught me. So what is the moral to this story? Is that if I'm going to put my fist through the wall, a lot of other people will. Because what I heard this morning was about a lack of fairness and a lack of respect. That's what I heard this morning. And people don't want that. And if they knew, they wouldn't tolerate it. But the problem is all they hear is rush, saying you're getting overpaid, you're not working, a kid can take your job. That's what they hear. What they don't hear is what the hell you do, and what they don't hear is how you're being treated. And so I'm going to share something with you. What do you know rush has? Rush has lots of radio stations. Guess what you have? You have lots of radio stations. You know why? Because you have a thing called a dial tone. And you have a thing called a phone. And I am going to tell you right now, they have radio stations in every single community in this country, and you have a phone. And one of the things you can do is you can start lobbying on the radio. You can start telling your stories. You can start. Tell people, tell me what it's like to get bitten on the arm. How much is that worth? Because that's what I do every day, because I'm taking care of your kid. Tell them about my favorite stories about the custodian who told my friend who's a principal, 
He said, there's a kid that gets set, let, let off at school every morning at 6 o'clock, an hour and a half before the school opens. And we knew exactly what kid it was, the principal said. The kid smelled. The kid was obviously hungry. But obviously, the mother had no place to put him. So the custodian said, can I bring him food? And can I give him some soap? And he said, some soap? He said, yeah, I got a shower. I think he needs a shower. And guess what? For two and a half years, every day, Nobody in the school knew but the principal and the custodian. He fed him. He gave him a shower. You want to fire that custodian? Over my dead body. That's the point. But if I know this, then they need to know it. Because until they know the story, they can't understand how valuable and essential you are. So that's part of your job, is you have to share with people what you do. And my recommendation is every Republican candidate should be invited in when they show up in your state and say, spend a day with me. We know you like to spend a day with the CEO. Well, you know what? It's time you see the other group, because it's us. Anyway, anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts or peanuts or anything? Did I say something that didn't make sense? I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I am, I am so grateful for what I learned today, but I'm also more exhausted by what I learned today. So you need to make change. And the other thing is, you also need to know that we have to value education, and what's happening now has been going on for a long time. I'm the daughter of two public school teachers. My first childhood memory is marching on Gracie Mansion in New York in the longest teacher strike in New York City history. I was 11 years old. I leave for college, I'm 17, I'm in the plane heading to St. Olaf College. And what does my father say? The man who I adored, the teacher of the year in New York City, whatever you do, don't become a teacher. The man I adored, the man who understood what a difference a teacher could make. But back in 1971 and 72, he already saw the assault on public education. So I need to remind you that if you don't fight, we all fail. Because you are what is our future. You are. And the fact that some people have somehow made you into the enemy, we have to reframe it. Because you are the essential. Anyway, no questions? No comments? Yes, ma'am. First of all, I want to thank you for coming. I sat with you at breakfast this morning, and I thought about it all morning long. It only took 10 minutes to just be inspired by you and just fired up to do something. So thank you. Um, let's see, I was going to say, I'm Sue Daly, and I'm from Washington State. And as with most of you, our health care is also being assaulted. And we're doing the best we can with the lobbying efforts, and we're actually holding it off but we don't know for how long. So I don't really know why I'm here other than to say I appreciate the encouragement I get. I appreciate being in a crowd that's my tribe, OK? And um, I'm just holding on to my blue state, and so are all of us with all our might. So hang in there. And, 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 that, that, and we need each other. One of the stories we heard this morning, we were talking about people, obviously, who work 10 months of the year, but have the summers off, but they can collect unemployment because that's the nature of their job. They are told that they are public sector education employees, and therefore, you have the benefit, lucky you, of working 10 months of the year and being unemployed for two months, but not collecting unemployment. I mean, talk about being ticked off. And then we hear the story that some people don't even get their health coverage covered during the two months they're not working in the summer. So not only do they have the insult of no paycheck, but now they have to pay the COBRA for the two months that they are not working. And more often than not, that COBRA is every single dime they would have in order to cover that bill. Do you know that people don't know that? Do you, I was like blown out of my mind. They're, and here's the kicker. So if you decide to drop your insurance, for the two months, because you can't afford the COBRA, what do you know? You're screwed. Because if you get sick during that two month period, guess what? We pay more because you are uncompensated care and we have to take care of you.
Talk about stupidity. Talk about not getting it. That story alone is worth the price of admission. People need to understand, why would you set people up to fail like that? Who can live without insurance every single year for two months? That's the plan? That makes no sense. Those are the stories that people in your community need to hear. They need to hear it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for what you said. I just wanted to tell you a little bit of a story that I just started a new job. Um, I've worked in the same school for 21 years, but I just started a new job as a parent community intake specialist. Mm -hmm. And my very first job that was given to me was a church gave us a bunch of money to help families out at Christmas. So I got to reach out to our parents, highest poverty zip code in the state of Washington, and I asked the parents, what can we do for you for the holidays? What can we do to make your Christmas better? And I was blown away because I thought to myself, all they wanted was clothes for their kids, socks, shoes, underwear, and the necessities. And they said to me, we weren't able to get our kids school clothes. OK. So I went out on a limb, and I asked this mom, I said, if I could get you anything, anything, what would it be? Dream big. And I knew she wasn't going to say an iPod or an iPad or whatever. And she said, Debbie, really? And I said, yes. She said, shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste. And I'm not kidding you. I was speechless. Yep. And I said to her, are you kidding? And she said, no. And I said, you've got it. So through community partnerships, we've started a hygiene clinic at our school so that our kids can come to school and get shampoo, deodorant, and not be embarrassed yep. that they can't even get their day gone essential needs met. And it just blew my mind and I thought, so I asked one of our Republicans um, senators, I said, come to my school. I want you to walk in my shoes yeah. as I talk to these parents exactly. who are struggling their behinds off to even make it. And then you tell me that you can say, no, I don't believe in you. What a crock. Well, I, I, it's an amazing story. And I just have to ask a question, a point of information. When you get food stamps, can you buy shampoo? No, that's it. Thank you very much. There's the problem. So here they have a limited amount of dollars that has to go for food, as if somehow you don't need to bathe, you don't need to shower, you don't need to clean your ass. I mean, come on. <laughs> Think about it. Who would do that to anyone? And then what's worse is, and I'll take your point, I went to an international women's conference at Harvard. And the question was asked of all these women, American women and international women from Europe and everywhere, what would you want more of? Would you want more time, or would you want more money? Time. Let me tell you what happened. Every American woman wanted more money, and every European woman wanted more time. Do you know why? Because in Europe, you don't have to pay for health care. Because in Europe, you don't have to pay for higher education. Because in Europe, you don't have to pay for child care. And in America, the reason why the women needed the money was to keep their families safe. Of course, they wanted the damn time. But you know what? Before you get your time, you got to make sure your kid can get to a doctor. And you will work three jobs to make it happen. But isn't that ironic? Look at the difference in the answer. Talk about how a quality of life is impacted when you say, give me money, and they say, give me time. Because you want the time, too. Yes, sir. Michael Musser, California. I want to thank you for bringing this message to us today. And I want us all to know how empowered we can be with the stories that we have. You know, we all think that, what can one person do? One person can go out and talk to their coworkers, or they can go out and talk to the rest of their family or their friends or members of the community. Because if they don't understand us, if they don't understand the, the level of poverty that we work in or the, the commitment that we have to the jobs that we do, then, then they are going to demonize us. And we will be the enemy. So we need to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations 
all across the United States so that we can be understood for what we contribute to society. So I encourage you to go out and just tell your story because your story is so powerful. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And, and just to let you know, there's a group of people you have to thank. And that's the Occupy Wall Street people. Because now, for the first time ever, the conversation isn't being dominated by those that say, oh, you're just suffering from class warfare. You just want what the 1% have. What the Occupy Wall Street people have done is show you the chairs. It's not about jealousy. It's not about class warfare. It's about the grotesque, unconscionable gap between rich and poor. That's what's wrong with America. That's called the Latin American model. That's what fails. And what we want is a place where we can all succeed. That's what we want. We don't want more. We don't want less. Just respect us, treat us fairly, and listen. And if you do that, not only is it good for us, it's actually good for the country. Because what did I say with that 1%? If we start taxing them and they say they want to leave, au revoir. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I didn't get a chance to say anything. Oh, 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 one more, one more. Wait, 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 wait. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's OK. My name is Tawana Exon. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Woo! And I just want to say that I went through analyzing your chairs. And a lot of us are past that 10% down there. And in Wisconsin right now, with the things that are happening with us, having to pay more in health care, having to pay into our pension, trying to stay with our union, and to provide for our families, after July 1st of this year, for our ESPs, we will no longer have a contract. We will not be able to bargain our anything other than our wages. We will not get a wage increase. How we will be able to keep our homes, keep our cars, um, have transportation, provide for our families, buy food, you know, keep things going like we did maybe about 10 years ago is gonna be impossible. So I just wanna say also to you, thank you for analyzing where we are right now but I'm past that 10%. Oh. I'm living in poverty. I'm borrowing toilet paper. Yeah. I'm borrowing food. I'm borrowing just the necessities just to do same thing that my kids are doing because we're in a large urban district. Yep. Same thing that some of us in here are doing. So well, thank you. I, 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 we're, we're with you. We're fighting with you. And, and here's a great analogy. You know when a house on the neighborhood goes into foreclosure and then all of a sudden, someone comes and pulls all the pipes and destroys the house. Tell me about the values of the house next door. So what we don't get is that when we destroy your life, we destroy our life. When they can't pay their bills, we can't eventually pay your bills. Main Street of every community needs to understand, if you can't survive, they don't either. That's the Velcro that holds us together. It can't work anymore. You're not on your own, Jack. You are, in fact, connected together. And it's that story of connectivity that's not only going to resonate, that's what wins. So thank you.